the entire GRF dilates and compresses. How can we make this efficiently? What I've got here is a, a, a polynomial curve generator. So we just kind of put a few coefficients in, like an x cubed term, an x squared term and stuff. So we can make this three-stage um, envelope be a function of a single time variable, which is taken from the, taken from the phaser. Um, the sound itself is a granular model. Um, and it's actually not based on any data. It's a, a little distortion trick, in fact, which uses um, a rapidly modulated filter um, to, to create these kind of grainy gravel type sounds. Yeah? And the nice thing about it is I can have, with a single variable, pretty much simulate the, the pressure uh, as a function of one variable. So um, I'm just applying this to the, uh, to the granular synthesizer. Now, one of the things that comes out of this is that obviously it's fairly modular. The actor and the signature process is decoupled from the sound production mechanism. And very early on in the project, I started to realize that there was something more to procedural audio than there, was, than there is to DSP and music synthesis. There's, there's another interpretation that we need to, to get any mileage out of this. And, and so a pattern starts coming up over and over again. And the pattern is this. Those of you that are into networks and computing have probably heard something like the OSI model, a layered model. You know, layered models are kind of common in a lot of things. They tend to somehow push things into the, from more concrete to the more abstract. And we have a system so that we're able... And the, the, the beauty of a layered model, of a modular system, is that this, con, this conceit allows us to pull out one of these layers and replace it with something else. So what I kind of posited in the uh, Designing Town textbook was something like this, where we kind of had this sort of thing. Um, I'll just put them up. It's the model, the method, uh, the implementation. I'm not asking that place. And the behavior. This is the interface, this is the thing that you do. Now we'll, look, we'll see how this kind of accrues from this in a moment. The method, it's really interesting if we could abstract away the synthesis method that we use from the sound that we're trying to produce. So you often see people say, well, hey, I made some string sounds. Well, how did you make those string sounds? Oh, I used subtractive synthesis. Well, great. Now, there's a, a well-known mathematical method, you know, a sort, an exciter, resonator, kind of arrangement, you've got some kind of source and filtering, uh, and this model works for being able to produce strings. You know how to use it, right? But you could also use FM, okay? You know what you're doing with FM synthesis as a technique, as a method. You could kind of pull out the, 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 the subtractive method and put an FM or a wave shaping method in here. And wouldn't it be cool if your parameters that you're driving your um, synthetic layer with just kind of instantly matched up with, the, with uh, the stuff that you've got. I mean, this is kind of the essence of software modularity, is to define interfaces. Could we kind of build a framework where I can make a wave shaping based model of the same thing and just slot it in? That would be really cool. So we have the method as the middle layer. Okay. The implementation at the bottom is the kind of the actual way you go about doing this, the language you use. So, I really wanted to cut through that whole, hey, I'm a super collider user. Um, oh, no, I use C-Sound. Never use super collider, it's rubbish. You know, the holy wars of, uh, of uh, implementations. It doesn't matter what implementation you use. A good model and method should produce, provide you with something which is implementation agnostic. So you can write it in C code if you want, if you're feeling masochistic. You can use C-Sound. You can... Uh, use pure data or max, whatever. So that would be really nice, and to a certain extent, you know, the project succeeded in kind of highlighting that. I think one of the people who's done more to, to 
prove that than myself is actually Dan Stoll, a super collider programmer from Queen Mary, who re implemented a whole bunch of the examples from Designing Sound in Super Collider and leave with some of the power of Super Collider there to, to make them even better. You know? So that was a really cool moment to see that you could take these designs and they really were implementation agnostic. So what about the relationship between the method and the model? I mean, what is the model? Okay. I think this is, this is really the key. That the model is an abstraction which makes, makes your procedural sound method agnostic. Okay. So you're not bound to... to um, your Bell model doesn't require the fact that you're using additive synthesis, for instance. The Bell model kind of contains a, if you like, mo a, a modal analysis of the Bell model. It, it is that kind, is that that model le level. It describes abstractly the way that the physics happens in, in the thing. Um, now, lots of the, the way that the physics happens kind of conversations are about interaction. This is where the field of SID, sonic interaction design, kind of that, where that really sort of blossoms and unfolds. It's about what gestures and actions or events in the world cause and parameterize these, these sounds. So if I'm moving a, a squeaky door open, you know, the force that I'm applying to the edge of the door sets up, given the mass of the door, a certain rotational velocity, yeah, which causes a certain moment of a uh, force around the hinge which sets off a stick slip friction model. So we can trace this back and look at it behaviourally in a rational and structured way. And say, okay, well it should sound like this if I move it like this. Yeah. This is where we interface between the model and the behaviour. So I'm just going to give you one really simple example kind of accruing from the footstep model uh, here, which is that as the actor runs away they're doing more work on the ball of the foot, yeah, so they're accelerating. So we want, want to shift the emphasis of the GRF signature onto the ball part. As you slow down, you tend to dig your heels in. So there's negative work done on the heel of the foot, yeah, as you're slowing down, which shifts the emphasis of the signature onto the heel part of the foot. Now, do I want to be dealing with those parameters as a sound designer? Hell no, okay. What we're always trying to do with good models is, is to encapsulate, is to hide internal parameters that the user of the sounding object doesn't really need to know about. So as the game developer, all I want to do is to say, attach this to a bipedal humanoid and have it so that it's back to the actor speed. Now we've got acceleration and deceleration built in, maybe they're a function of the mass and the inventory that you're carrying. But, so what I've done here with this next model is to, um, this is a differential model, as the actor speeds up, accelerates, work goes onto the ball. So we're just taking the first difference here with this delta. This is a snazzy way of using a low pass filter with a subtraction, you know, an acute uh, delta function. And um, doing it in the audio domain, as you can see, it's kind of quite, it works, it's okay. Um, just watch, watch the sliders, really. That's the only thing to say about this one. Um, so as I speed up, I would slow down. Can you see how these both are changing? It's true, but what we're effectively doing is we're getting second order behaviour at this layer of the model. Above the actual synthetic model. I'll pause here. Uh, I just want to see if there's any any questions uh, and if this 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 material is working for you guys. Um, just have a moment, and then I'm going to show you um, something about modularity and scalability. Well, maybe you can talk more about the actual parameters in the previous one. Yeah. <laughs> the sliders that you have and how do they influence a bit more about the actual sound going on. So you mentioned it's granular. Yeah. But what are the little tricks? Because you always have these neat little DSP tricks. So maybe you can present some of those within this patch. Um, 
Yeah, um, just kind of real quick, let's have a look at this uh, texture source. Um, oh, I've got a whole bunch in here that I don't even realize it's got these guys in here. Uh, so you can select a different kind of texture using the same GRF. Um, I have no idea how to, I probably have to type some names into this. Oh, gravel or something. Uh, maybe I can, maybe this wood one here. Um, Oh, let's just reroute it. So let's get this one going. Um, is this the one? This is the one. Differential one. And, um, really set myself up here when I told Slacko I'd do some live coding for you. Okay, very roughly, um, what we've got is uh, a noise generator. And we get a noise generator and we're low pass filtering the noise, so it's very, very low frequency noise. Yeah? And I'm rectifying that. In old analog electronics, what we do is we just take the negative parts and we make them positive. Yeah? So now I've got a whole bunch of kind of libbles like this, uh, just uh, little curves pointing up. And I want to um, effectively expand them so that they're short and there's more sight, uh, that, they, that they start growing slowly and then grow quickly. And, and so I've used a squared function to do that. And do this uh, squaring or cubing is, is a great way to just simply change the, the rate of the curve. Yeah? So these then control the cutoff frequency of a filter which is, which is uh, passing white noise <coughs> with a certain resonance. And so they create these little grains which are kind of each one is like a little crunch sound. Yeah? What I can do with the grain generator is um, I can set a threshold function above which none shall pass, or rather below which none shall pass, and, and above which these, the heads, the tops of these little grains start to poke through. So I'm kind of providing a min function, min max function here to, to kind of cut them off. And really that's what I'm doing for my grain density, because the white noise, tend, because it's evenly distributed in amplitude, it's Gaussian, uh, it's uh, uniform in amplitude, um, we tend to get some very big peaks and some very small ones. So given this range of amplitudes, if I kind of move this threshold up and down, when the threshold's very low, I've got lots of grains. When the threshold's very high, I've just got a few of them. So what I'm doing with the GRF is effectively dipping this, this threshold level down. So it's scooping into the uh, a more dense region of grains. Uh, yeah, so it's um, a very compact trick to do that. Yeah. <clears throat> So you have a single layer, you don't have many layers of grades, it's just a single layer. No, that's a single layer, a single, that's a single layer, layer, yeah. Um, uh, I'd love to show you all the different textures, but I'm kind of not set up to patch here. Maybe we can rearrange for the workshop. Okay, cool. Okay. <clears throat> so, um... Okay, um... So this next topic I'd like to look at is um, it's about reuse and structure. Uh, my background before becoming interested in procedural audio, uh, having worked in the music industry, it's, you know, uh, involved in signal processing, sound effect design, and all this kind of thing, it is from classical CSEE. So I was kind of a pro, uh, you know into programming and computer science and things like that. And for a little while, I taught software engineering. The ideas of software engineering, I think, have really been influential in, in the way that I approach computational audio, because there's a huge a lot there's a huge amount of complexity. And how do we deal with complexity as artists? This is a big problem with technology. Technology, art, and complexity have this strange relationship. A lot of the time, you go into the studio and you, your creative modus operandi is to dick around with stuff. Yeah? You kind of exhaustively explore the space. And then you find something great and you go, ah, I've solved it, that's it, that's great. 
but you aren't really aware of your methodology. You aren't aware of how you got there. Um, now, aware is, a, is, a, is a, I chose that word carefully. That doesn't mean you don't know. A lot of sound designers, a lot of uh, creative individuals who work with technology at a high level, don't have, they have ineffable knowledge. They have subconscious or hidden knowledge. So they, know, they don't know that they know how to do something. Yeah? They find that they're able to do it, but if you ask them, they kind of completely go to pieces and say, well, I kind of don't know. Yeah? And the test is you go into the studio the next day and you've messed up the settings, and you say, try and get that back, and you say, I can't. You know? It was an accident of chance. Well, actually, it wasn't, but you kind of need to go through that process again. So how do we structure <coughs> knowledge? Big question, as, as it applies to complexity and um, media, digital media software. So one of the things that, that I've kind of archaeologically scooped around doing this is that the principles of software engineering absolutely apply to digital media. They can be, there's so much that we can take from Jackson and Somerville and all of these kind of heroes of software engineering and say, this philosophy really works in constructing large scale complex digital media like games. And I was actually shocked at the, the paucity of software engineering in the games industry. A lot of the time it's just, well, yeah, we'll kind of try this and we'll try that. And very few companies have been around long enough to have a, 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 a a culture and, a, and know what they know, you know what I mean? In the Socratic sense, they know what they know. So, one of these principles is in modularity, structure and reuse. It's that most sounds are fractal in their nature in a certain way. In the same way that you can look at an image, the JPEG algorithm, will pick out bits which are kind of reusable and put them through some affine transformations and Grow the, the grow the big picture from little pictures. We we can absolutely do this with sound, yeah? and I think that cognitively we structure sound in this way. Um, it's not, not something I've looked at very formally, but I, I, I'm kind of got a, a gut instinct about this. This is the way that we that we structure sounds internally. Um, so what I'd like to show you is a sequence, if you like, now of building from small objects into larger and larger objects. So we begin with the ability to make really small, everyday sounds. When you're in a games world, you're walking around, one of the things that you interact with the most is a uh, switch. So you kind of like... And you hear the sound it makes, it's kind of a little click sound, yeah? We can look at the mechanics of that, we can look at the poles and throws of switches, the contribution made by the radiation of the panel, how it couples with the sound acoustically to the air in the room and stuff. But at the end of the day, it ain't a complex sound, right? We can probably get away with an envelope generator, some heuristics on the spectrum of it, something that kind of sounds a bit plasticky. So here is exhibit A, there's a little switch, and when we want to click it, we press here. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, something that you, could, that you could immediately make a data saving within a procedural world, let's say that we have um, an apartment building with um, a thousand switches in it. I'll make each one of these be a slightly different bit of code and modify it according to the texture to the, the material on which the switch is mounted. Because clearly, you know, it's the panel here which has an acoustic <coughs> radiation. Yeah? You can't really hear much of the switch itself. But if we were to look inside, you would be almost insulted to see how simple this is. There's no modelling here of, um, of a plastic panel. I'm not looking at the modes of it. Uh, I'm not lo looking at the tension in the spring or anything like that. I've got an envelope generator, some white noise, a filter, jobs are good. Yeah? Why? Because I'm interested in the, the surface effects. I'm interested in this in terms of not accurately modeling its behavior, because it has no behavioral depth. It's a switch. How many different ways can I switch it? Yeah? Slowly, maybe. Oh, I don't know. It's just, there's, no, there's no behavioral depth. So why bother to try and unpack depth in the model here? Yeah? We take a, a, a phenomenal, in the philosophical language I use for this is a phenomenal approach. We're interested in this in a sort of Kantian style of what it's like from the outside, not the thing in itself, but what's its perception. Yeah? 
And this is how a lot of, of, of synthesis work is, the sound design is. It's constrained to a particular view. Um, but as we'll see, there's a, continuity, a continuum now between this and adding complexity to unwrap behavioural depth. So, when I'm interested in behavioural depth, such as in the next example here, where I've got uh, an instrument panel in my whatever, I don't know what it is, tank, an aeroplane or something, and uh, I've got these different kinds of switches that go. Here. Then I need some more. I need some more, more complexity to my model. Yeah. So I'm going to start building that in. Let's unpack this and see what we've got here. Now I'm more interested in the mechanics of the switch, of the metal spring, of the uh, of the throw that moves across and hits the poles, uh, and Looking here, uh, this area where I've got a feedback delay, you can see I'm modelling the resonance of the panel. So I've got a single waveguide, yeah, which is just giving me a, a particular resonance of the panel. And I can make these sw parameterise these switches to interact in slightly different ways. So I could change the latch time, I could change the force by changing the frequencies in the ping, and I'm layering those on top of each other. So we've got. Um, Two very slightly different tones, can you hear those? And this little, yeah. which is actually an additive model, okay? uh, I think what I've got in there is uh, perhaps a couple of, yeah, just a couple of oscillators, yeah? In a very short envelope. So make this. And you can hear how that's layered onto the top of these ones. Yeah. So as it pings out, as it comes out, you hear the, the ping of the, the metal. Well, yeah, if we can do this, let's kind of keep building, reusing these parts to build higher levels of complexity. So then we've got this kind of switch, sort of like a rotary one that moves around. And there's several parts in it that move. Now, each of those parts is made from the parts that we've already made. The software we use is good. We don't want to wear ourselves out patching. So we make them into abstractions and reuse them in higher level models. Uh, and following this method, I'm just going to show you that essentially this patch here is the same thing as a switch. Just a, it's just a question of scale. So here's a little game here. Um, which I'm not even going to attempt to play, I don't think, because I'm not really set up here. Let's just give it a go. Maybe I won't be under too much pressure. Um, there we go. Getting a hang of this, yeah. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, what have we got? Uh, completely ignoring the game logic, which is a bunch of random questions, and it's a one or zero to pick, yeah. Um, we've got the mechanics of the clock sound, tick tock, tick tock. There's your pressure sound, yeah. There's your background sound, but that's kind of intrinsic to the game, right? If you're into like uh, music on television or film, you have tension beds. <laughs> tension bed is that even if it's not explicit, even on those modern, you ever seen anybody diffuse a bomb on a film that didn't have a countdown timer that went beep, 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 or something, you know? It didn't do something that kind of was unsettling to kind of pressure you. Well, that's the sound here, yeah? Um, that's its function. Let's look at how we make it. Okay, so um, I remember taking apart exactly this alarm clock when I was kind of seven or eight years old, yeah? Big old plastic Mickey Mouse clock, uh, and the mechanism inside it's kind of quite small. Uh, the body of the clock creates a hell of a lot of the character of the sound, right? It wasn't until nearly 20 years later that I had my hands on some high, fre high frequency sampling that's like 96 kilohertz, must have been, because it would be up to 192. So, it was the best sampling gear I'd ever laid my hands on. And I got a contact microphone and I put it on a watch. 
and I recorded some of the watch and then I slowed it down massively. And what I heard was amazing. It's that the tick, 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 tick of the watch was just all of these intricate synchronous events. So you've got a cog moving here, which clicks another cog, and this clicks this other cog. And ultimately it's all connected to this energy source, this spring, which is kind of unwinding on a, an escapement mechanism, which is moving really fast. Like, tick, 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 and then you've got the, so you slow it down a hundred times and you hear and then the hand goes and then the whole thing kind of happens again everything's happening like a sequence like a musical sequence in the perfect place that it should according to the physics so why don't I just take a model of like the interaction of this circular metal plate the cog, and make an arrangement of them, and speed it all up. Yeah. So let's look inside here and see that we've got inside our game uh, the time bomb sounds here, and inside the time bomb sounds is the clock. And uh, let's set it running. I think we probably want to. Um, And then let's break it apart. Take away the escape mechanism. And you can hear this is one of the ticks, yeah? Also, I'm just going to remove it from the body of the clock. So I'm going to take the mechanism out of the body of the clock. And now you can just hear the, the metal parts on their own. And when we look inside this, what we'll see is that it's actually made up of a sequence of, of micro events. I guess this is um, micro sound in, in the sense that Curtis Rhodes intends it and explores it. Yeah? Micro sound being at this sort of sub perceptual level, yeah. garbage threshold, things which are 20, 30, 40 milliseconds long. And they don't really sound like anything in themselves. When you hear them separately, it's like, well, that's, that's not anything. It's just like a, a, a little clip. But it's not until you, you, you have them arranged in time that they become significant. So let's, let's drill down into this even more. This is actually made up of a sequence of three things. Yeah. This is... There's our simplest one. Yeah. But that itself is not just a clip. There's our model of our circular plate. That's a modal representation of... Um, small metal circular plate and it's just a kind of ping with a bunch of sine waves in there and we're going to take one of those and I'm going to make it so that this takes from this delay chain and you hear that? That's really subtle. Now there's two of them yeah. and now let's add another one. Did you hear that? Real subtle tiny little extra ping in there. So I'm going to take two of these, and they're slightly different from each other. I'm going to place them one on the offbeat, one on the onbeat. Now we've got two of those moving, yeah? Now the little escapement mechanism, which is running at a higher speed. I don't know if you guys get ears good enough for that. It's kind of quite high, it's up there at 9k or something. It's like... Yeah? And, um, then we'll place this into the acoustic cavity. So we've got a, a 